All right, so we said that the collective bargaining process involves negotiations between employers and employees over key subjects for negotiation. Um, so in the sport industry, here are the people that are typically involved in that process. Um, so on the league side, you see here, you have obviously the team owners are represented. Obviously, there's going to be lawyers uh, involved on behalf of those owners who have the legal knowledge. Um, the commissioner is typically involved on the league side in terms of sort of representing that group. So that's who you're, who the parties are on the league side of things. And then on the union side or the players union side, these are the folks usually um, represented. So there, most leagues will vote on uh, specific player representatives to basically act on behalf of the other players in the league, because obviously not every player can be at the bargaining table. So typically each league will have player reps from a variety of teams that act on behalf of those players in those discussions. Um, some leagues have what we know as an executive board of voted on members that they want uh, representing them. It's not true of all leagues, but it is of some. Um, and then of course, there's also gonna be legal folks um, representing the players as well or on behalf of the union. So, so we think about sort of the, the star player and the common player, they're gonna be on the union side. And as we think about the big market owner and the small market owner, they're gonna be on the league side. Um, it's not unlikely to see also uh, the use of mediators when it comes to collective bargaining negotiations. If you remember way back to the beginning of the semester, we talked about how kind of an alternative way to resolve disputes in the sport industry is by using a mediator and arbitrator. And this is one of those examples where a mediator might come in handy. Um, you think about the benefits of bringing in an impartial party who can basically act uh, as a middleman or woman between the two parties to help them get to a place of compromise. And that's ultimately what an impartial mediator would do in these situations. Um, particularly if it feels as though things are heading toward an impasse, then the league is most likely or, or to bring in some kind of mediator to help conversations. All right, so a couple key terms we need to identify here in terms of CBA negotiations. So earlier we mentioned this term of impasse, which is basically just a failure for both sides to come to an agreement. Um, and if that occurs, then it is possible for one of the sides involved to initiate what we call concerted activity. Um, so concerted activity, is basically a work stoppage, okay? Uh, and there are ultimately three outcomes to that that are possible in the sport industry. You could have a lockout, that is an owner-initiated work stoppage where they are essentially locking out the player, so they are initiating that stoppage. You could have a strike, that is player-initiated work stoppage, that's where the, essentially the players walk out and refuse to work until they get their demands. So those are the two common results of an impasse, but also occasionally we'll see this where uh, both sides agree that they will continue to work, they'll continue to host games without a CBA until they can reach an agreement. So that can happen too if both sides are really trying to avoid a work stoppage. Now, I want you to think here now about the different stakeholder groups that could be impacted should a professional sports league engage in concerted activity, whether that be a lockout or a strike in particular. Um, and this will be one of your learning checkpoints. I really want you to think about the different parties that could be involved and, and also try to think outside the box and not just think about the obvious parties that might be uh, initially impacted. Okay, uh, earlier we, we talked about mandatory subjects of bargaining. We said these are legally required subjects for organizations to negotiate over with their employees. And those three categories, as you can see here, are wages, hours, and terms and conditions. So I'll give you some examples of all of these things here. In terms of pay, obviously we're talking about uh, salaries under wages, we're talking about for hours, a little unique in sport, we might not necessarily be talking about nine to five hours, but we're talking about the length of a potential season and how many games are played, that sort of thing. Um, and then terms and conditions is sort of just any kind of policy in place that could impact the workplace environment for an athlete. So you can see there's a number of things that fall under this category.